get them to laugh in the, as soon as possible when they're watching the documentary, you can kind of bring their defenses down and they can kind of relax where it's not them in a classroom. Hi, Patrick. Hi, Olga. How are you doing? I'm really good. How are you? Good. Excited to talk to you. Yeah, thank you so much for taking the time. And I know it's getting late there over in L.A. It's not too late. Um, we're, uh, we're just missing dinner right now, but this yeah, is worth sorry. it. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. I'm a writer-director based out of L.A. Um, I started out as a journalist. And um, I still am a journalist. You know, I write, um, I'm an entertainment editor, so I interview bands, filmmakers, and whatnot. That's kind of my day, my day job. Um, and, you know, I've been screenwriting. I graduated from Cal State Northridge and got my master's degree. Um, and from that, I worked, I uh, was a ghostwriter for Tony Scott, the oh, English cool. director. Um, Top Gun and uh, Man on Fire and so I worked there for a while um, as a ghostwriter where I would work for different producers and, and writers that he was affiliated with um, and as a ghostwriter you're just kind of you're writing other people's stuff um, you're doing maybe the first couple drafts of stuff and then you know the writers are coming in and, 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 and rewriting you and whatnot and um, so I did that for a couple of years. I, I worked there, and then I, I wrote a horror movie with another producer, writer. Um, but, you know, when you're doing the ghostwriting, you're not getting credit for anything. You're kind of just um, – you're kind of the gimp in the closet, I used to call myself, where, like, you know, you're, you're doing all the work, but you're not going to the meetings. You're not meeting um, – you're not on set. You're, you know, you're, you're, you're just kind of doing the, the dirty work. You know, you're getting the script off the ground, and with the first couple of drafts, you're just trying to get the story on paper. Um, so, you know, I, uh, I did that for a couple of years, um, and then, you know, I find I, I basically wanted it was a job, but it wasn't a career. So I, um, you know, just started writing myself, and I sold a few pitches, um, and, and you know, you're just writing scripts and kind of starting all over. After it was weird because. Right after film school, I was working right away, you know, with a big time uh, director and producers and kind of I was in, involved very quickly um, upon graduating, but I had no name. So when I left and tried to do my own thing, I was just like starting out again. Yeah. Um, so, you know, after a couple of years of doing that, I just decided, you know, I'd, I'd sell stuff even and it wouldn't get made or if it did get made, um it wasn't what I wrote, you know, by the time it gets to the screen, it's been changed so many times. And so I was just like, you know what, I'm going to try directing my own thing. Um, and so I had this pilot that I had, um, had it was optioned and um, they didn't do anything with it. And so I ended up just filming the, the teaser of it, of the TV show. I was like, you know, I'm just going to get some money from some buddies uh, who are gracious enough to, you know, have some faith in me. Um, and we shot this, it was basically, you know, like in the beginning of a show, there's a teaser for the, you know, before the, the show comes, you see like the first three minutes of it and then it goes into the show. Yeah. Um, so we just shot that. Um, and it was about this, uh, girl, this girl who, who um, does graffiti. And so like, it would be a ba basically like a day in the life of a graffiti artist. Yeah. Um, and at the end of it, she pulls down her mask and reveals that it's a girl. Yeah. So um, we shot that all like in downtown LA, like all guerrilla style, and it's shot on a GoPro. So you know, I think with that, I just wanted—I knew I didn't have a lot of money. I wanted to do something that was people hadn't seen before. Um, so we shot it from like a POV, like a video game. So you see that graffiti artist going through the day of like riding the subway and sketching in the book, and then going to seal the spray cans and then going out on the wall and spraying the, you know, the mural and then getting chased by some homies and then running. And so it was, it was very different because I, I knew that you, you go to these film festivals, you kind of see all the same movie all the time, you know, these really beautiful movies that are artsy and kind of, you know, a little surreal and whatnot. I just wanted to do something that was easily digestible, that kind of stood out and that was centered around someone you hadn't seen before, which is a girl graffiti artist. So was it a um, real graffiti artist or was it an actor? It was an actor. So uh, we hired 
a real graffiti artist to do the artwork. Um, but the actress, actually, we lucked out, was a Christina Masterson. This, she was a Pink Power Ranger uh, oh. back in the day. So <laughs> she was great at, like, running around. Yeah. And she was great with, like, the breathing of the ADR. And so she was very – you had to find an, an actress that had a physicality. Yeah. You know, they could run around. And, and we had a stunt girl that do the, the hard tricks, you know, the hard jumps and whatnot. But, you know, she was great in that she looked – she it felt like the part. Because when you're doing something that's POV, the acting's all in the, you know, the movements, the turning of the head, you know, the, the running of the, the arms. And, you know, it's all physicality. So to have someone that had done that before, you know, was great. Um, and so it looks, you know, it looks really good in terms of just, we accomplished what we wanted to in terms of creating a short piece that I think stands out because it's just different. Yeah. Um, and what's next for that? What stage is it at? So the, that was a couple of years ago and we, 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 you know, we did the film festivals. We did like over two dozen film festivals. Um, we played at Fresh Flicks, I think, in, in Australia. Um, one of the festivals there, I don't remember. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, it's on Amazon Prime right now. You can watch it there. It's called Tag, um, and so that's where it is now. And then from that, you know, now you, now that I had that, I could show people to get work. I was you can't just say, well, yeah, you're a writer director. What do you do? You have what to be directed? So I had this cool little piece, um, and, and so from that, you know, I've kind of done some other things. Um, I did this documentary that I just finished called Four Year Consideration. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so it's about these two street artists. Uh, one's called Plastic Jesus. He's from London originally. He's a photojournalist, uh, but he's out here in LA now. And so every year for the past five to six years, he's done an Oscars piece. And his whole thing, he's kind of like the LA Banksy. He kind of, you know, he wears a mat, uh, a bandana to cover his face because he's, you know, he's not supposed to, well, yeah, he's, he's, a, he's not an American citizen, so he's afraid that he'll get arrested and <laughs> get deported or whatnot. Um, so every year he does an Oscar piece to kind of talk about, um, you know, Hollywood and kind of comment on Hollywood's. Um, one year it was the, the um, uh, Oscar statue with the heroin uh, needle in it after the Philip, Philip Seymour Hoffman, yep, uh, you know, one. Yeah, and yeah. he did one with um, the Oscars uh, doing a line of coke on the red carpet. Yep. Um, so this year, you know, I interviewed him last year for my day job, and he had done a Kanye West and Jesus Christ, like it's called False Idols. Um, and so I, the next year, I was like, hey, you know, what are you doing this year? And he's like. I'm going to do Harvey Weinstein. So I was like, oh man, that would make a great like short film. So he let me, he let me and my uh, partner in this, James uh, Armstrong, um, film him, his process of it. And originally the idea was just to, I wanted to document, you know, we always see art um, in a museum or on a wall, uh, but we never see like the blood, sweat, and duct tape that actually goes into making the art. So I wanted to document like, that um, the artist is like process in terms of initializing something, um, see, you know, making it and then putting it out there, executing it. So um, he teamed up with a, an, another artist called Joshua Ginger Monroe, um, who did those naked trumps from a couple years ago where they put them all in all a bunch of cities. Um, he's a great sculptor. So they teamed up and they made this Harvey Weinstein casting couch which was Harvey Weinstein in a robe, a gold-plated, like, Oscar-style Harvey Weinstein, um, sitting on a couch. And the idea was that, that, you know, people would come and sit down and take selfies with it and then kind of, you know, think about it, you know, after a while and be like, you know, I'm sitting here with this monster, you know. And that was the whole idea was to kind of, do an art piece that made pe that made people stop, think, and kind of react to it. You know, that's that's kind of what they do with their art. They really want to draw a response from people. And what was um, the response you were getting? Was it positive or? Well, was yeah. It so yeah, they put it out on um, on Hollywood Boulevard, about a block away from the Academy Awards. You know, it was uh, right a couple of days before. 
Um, and the new screws came out, and you know, I didn't realize that the I thought it would get press, but the thing went viral. It was covered yeah. from anywhere from Time Magazine to you know Vice to Vogue, yeah. um, o- o- overseas BBC, and it just kind of went. You know, it was it was the perfect timing for it um, with the whole Me Too movement starting and the wine scene stuff kept coming out. You know, new women were coming out and. Um, you know, being in LA, you always heard of these stories kind of in the background, but you never knew like the extent of it, you know? So I think it was just a combination of making an art piece that was a, a satirical, but it just, it was perfect timing for them. And so after reviewing all the footage, we were like, wow, like there's a, there's more to this story, you know? And, um, the other thing was James and I are, are men. We're documenting two male street artists. So, you know, commenting on a male, you know, Harvey Weinstein sex offender. So there's a lot of males, you know, there's no female perspective. So I was like, well, we got to talk to some women, you know, and see what this piece means. You know, what, was it, um, was it, did it come off as kind of jumping on the bandwagon or what was it, you know, satirical? So were women offended, you know, victims and whatnot? So, you know, then we, the second part of it was kind of getting that perspective. So I tracked down Meg Zaney, who's this um, female feminist street artist out here, um, and we interviewed her. And um, we interviewed this right wing street artist called, his name is Sabo. Who incidentally, him and Plastic Jesus have a rivalry. Um, he's a right wing street artist, which is you know very punk rock nowadays because most street artists are liberals, you know. And so he he actually did another piece, Oscar's piece that week about um, pedophilia in Hollywood, and he took over some billboards on La Brea. Um, so we interviewed him, and kind of he was the quote unquote antagonist of the piece where he's kind of saying, well, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, this is taken too far or maybe, maybe there's just one incident and now liberals are taking this me too movement and it's going to accuse everyone. And he brings up, you know, he's just kind of a counter argument. I think every good documentary has a counter argument to kind of give you some perspective. So it's just not all one sided. Um, and then, you know, I, I, I knew that we had to talk to someone that was, you know, involved in, in this Weinstein case. So I just Googled um, Harvey Weinstein victims and I started trying to track them down and showing them some footage that we had. Um, and about the six, six or seventh um, woman I, I sent an email to, I responded and her name was Don Dunning. And she was one of the first women that came out in the original New York Times article to speak out against Weinstein about her experience. So um, she was, you know, really open to talking. And she lives in Brooklyn, but she happened to be in L.A. She's a costume designer. She was an aspiring actress, you know, um, and her whole experience with Weinstein basically made her stop acting. So it was just a great, it was a great um, interview in terms of now we have someone that's um, directly involved in, in these crimes, you know, let, um, and, you know, how does an art piece like that affect her? Um, so I thought that was a really good perspective to get. And I think that was kind of the, the final piece that we were missing. Yeah. And um, so you haven't released this yet. Am I right? Yeah, we, no, we finished it in, um, in early fall. And so now it's just about submitting to film festivals and whatnot. We had a screening for cast and crew and friends, and uh, Dawn uh, actually came out from Brooklyn. So she came, the artist came. Um, we, um, we had, yeah, we had it in downtown LA. It went, went really well. Um, and so that was the first time we showed it to an audience. It's played a couple, or uh, one film festival so far, but, you know, most of the film festivals are in, uh, after the new year, you know, coming up. So hopefully we'll get into some, you know, more. We've gotten a couple we've gotten into. We're going to be playing in um, Maryland at the Ocean City Film Festival in March. 
and at the New Jersey and uh, the Trenton Film Festival. So, you know, as 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 more festivals um, book us, um, we'll be putting it up on our website where you can check out the film. Yeah, great. Do you yeah. know if he's doing anything for this year's Oscars? Uh, you know, I asked him. He hasn't told me yet. Um, but you know, the, it's going to be hard because the wine scene was such a it was such a a, a big thing in Hollywood. You know, it's probably the, one of the biggest stories of the past 20, 30 years, you know, in terms of just, um, the gross, the, the uh, gross negligence, which we kind of touch on where we have Meryl Street, you know, talking about wine scene like he was a God, you know? So I thought it was important to include that if Hollywood is, you know, you know, Hollywood was a part of this in terms of letting it go on. You know, I think that's some important to talk about. Um, so yeah, it's uh, I think it's a great topic. I don't know what he's doing, no, but I don't know what he's doing. This so, year. Yeah. So let's talk about documentary filmmaking. Sure. Um, well, I would like I... to have a chat about how do you incorporate a social message into the storytelling of a documentary, and in your opinion, what makes a good documentary? Yeah, I think it's I think. Uh, personally, I like documentaries that do have a social message. I think all my films so far, um, like I just finished this horror thriller piece that's uh, scripted, but it, it talks about domestic violence and looks at it through a genre lens. But for a documentary, um, I think it's important because you you can't be so like hard hitting where you're because when people hear documentary, they immediately think oh my God, I'm going to have to learn something, you know, or I'm going to have to sit down and pay attention to it, right? So it's funny, my neighbor is an editor, and he, um, he edited the Mr. Rogers documentary. So, you know, as I had all this footage coming in, I was like, you know, I, I knew that I wanted to do something that was, that had a message, because um, for a documentary, that's how you get people's attention. Everyone's kind of, you know, opening their ears now to con to films that have something to say, not just an expression, but have a comment on something. And then you can kind of take it whatever side you're on, pick a side and, and you know, enjoy the film. So anyways, he was telling me, you know, when, when an audience s sits down for a documentary, I always wait for them to laugh. He's like, if you can get them to laugh in the, as soon as possible when they're watching the documentary, you can kind of bring their defenses down. They can kind of relax where it's not them in a classroom. Yeah. So I thought, I was like, wow, you know, that's a great note in terms of just, okay, I have to go watch a documentary, but making them laugh. So now it's going to bring out a different type of emotion. Um, and so what I love about the art piece is it is social commentary. Um, and it's talking about some dark stuff, you know. Um, but at the same time, it's art. It, the piece is, while provocative, it is kind of funny. Like, it's Harvey Weinstein in a bathrobe. There's gold. It's kind of just outrageous, you know? Where, um, so I think, I think when you do a documentary with a social message, it's important not to just hammer people over the head with your message. Um, and I also think it's important, like I said before, to have two sides of it, where you're not just one side in an argument. I hate when I watch documentaries and it's all about, well, this, this, and that, yeah, and like, okay, so you, you, you probably came, because when you are already watching something, you probably already have an opinion coming into it, and so if you're reinforcing, you know, most people have the same majority of the idea of what something is, you know, this is bad, and this is good, yeah. so when I see a documentary that only has one side, it, it, it makes me think that they're trying to tell me, they're trying to push me somewhere, and I don't want, uh, that's what I don't want, um, for me, honestly, and from what the, the audiences that have watched the film have said, one of their favorite characters is Sabo, you know, the right wing sheriffs, where they are like, I don't agree with what he says, but he's just so funny and charming in his own way that I appreciate, you know, I can, I can listen to his rants, you know, and I can listen to his opinion, and I'm not closed off to it because he's bringing another side to it in such a in such an entertaining way. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, documentaries are tough, um, but they're so popular right now. And I think um, I wanted to make something. I come from a scripting background, so this was my first documentary of any kind. Um, but I was a journalist, so that helped a lot as well. 
where I was good at interviewing people. And, you know, that's the whole skill of documentaries where, you know, you're sitting down with them and you have to build a rapport. You have to kind of get, you know, because people, some people love to talk. And sometimes those people, they love to steer the conversation to whatever they want to say. Um, then there's the people who don't open up. And you've kind of got to, you know, dig, 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 but kind of move around and then let them kind of open up to you. So it's a real skill that, you know, as a journalist really helped me interviewing, you know, thousands of people throughout the years, just learning how to steer, steer conversations and kind of stopping people when they want to go to, when you're not, when they're staying off topic, you know, straying off topic, you can guide them back um, to what you're there for. Um, and then editing really helped with the journalist background in terms of, you know, I, I, I when you, it would remind me a lot of like interviewing a bunch of people for a story, um, where you have these different quotes. And so what I did was I just, I looked at all the footage and I put it on a board and like I would write an article, I would pick statements and, you know, arguments and then just kind of connected it like on a board, um, and that's how the, that's how I edited the documentary with James. You know, then we went in and edited it. Now that's what I was curious about. Do you have a story outline of you know this is where the documentary is going to go, or do you just go out and film and then piece it together? Yeah, that that's that's the, the difference here is that with the doc, when, you know, with, you don't have a script, so you just have people talking and you don't know what they're going to say. You can kind of steer the conversation, um, but at the end of the day, people are people, and they're going to say what they want to say, and they're not. They're going to say things you agree with that would help the documentary, help tell the story better. They're going to say things that you don't agree with that could take it another way. Um, so going into it, I knew that the story was about making this piece, the conceptualization of the, the piece, the making of it, and then the reaction to the piece. That would be the first part, and I knew that. The second part would be the re the post um, of the piece, like what was the reaction to other people? And then, you know, tell the wine scene story in the second half of it. Um, so, yeah, I think it was, once I looked at all the footage, I was just like, wow, you know, now I gotta put it on a board. And it's funny, I was, someone asked me the same question the other day, and I was just like, you know, when you have a script, when you're writing it, you're God, where you can kind of, have the characters do their thing, but you're kind of controlling the world, right? Like they can't go off that much because you're, this is the story you're telling and you're God. But in a documentary, you're just a guy with a camera, you know, God is God. You're just documenting what's in front of you. And, and no matter how much you want things to play out, they're playing out the way they are, you know, in reality. So yeah, I think, you know, you, you've got to keep an open mind. Um, you've got to, You've got to, I think the story comes out in the edit, edit of course. That's the difference, the big difference. Um, it, you know, it's different. It's, it's, it's a different it's a different animal. But at the same time, this was probably the easiest project I did. Um, just because it, it seemed like everything kind of just fell in line. Um, yeah. you so know. How do you know when you have enough footage? I, I could see that the temptation would be to just keep filming and getting oh, yeah. more and more. I mean, with a story like this, too, I mean, we had, it's funny, we have uh, A.J. Argento, a quote from her in the documentary. And I think after we, you know, finished it, I think a couple weeks later it came out that she was accused of sexual harassment by one a, a child actor. Yeah. So it was like, oh, my God. <laughs> and then, you know, it was like, we could literally, and there's still stuff about Weinstein coming out every other day, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's like anything. It's like you finally just have to end. You, here's the story. Here's the best I can tell you know, in, in, the, you, in this amount of time. Um, and then you just got to finish it. Yeah, I mean, you just could go on forever because it's such a deep topic. There's, and and I, think, I think our story is a small part, small, interesting story of a much, of a much bigger topic. Um, and that's what I think a good, you know, these short form documentaries that people are doing now, it's a great thing because they're so bite sized little pieces. You know, if you're not sitting in a documentary in the theater for two hours, you can kind of watch these on your phone. 
watch them on, you know, in, in, at lunch at, on your desktop. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's, it's a cool, um, it's a cool genre that's, that's rising that, that I think that we fit in perfectly. I mean, James and I did all the work, uh, you know, we shot, um, we edited, we did sound. It was a two man crew. Um, but going back to what you were saying was we had invest, we basically said, well, we need help to make it better after we have all this footage. So after we edited and done all the stuff, we knew that to, to make it to a theater level quality, movie quality stuff, we needed good sound design and we needed good original music. Um, and then we, you know, that animation part in the, in the film, um, which I think is important for a documentary that you kind of have something to break up the kind of, you know, hard edge stuff. And I think that the animation does that, you know, um, and we, we didn't shoot any of the footage in Las Vegas of him sculpting it. So I was like, oh man, we have them talking about it, but we don't have it. How can we do it in a way that kind of lets the audience breathe yet um, gives us a little another side to the, you know, the piece. And so we did the animation. Um, we got the uh, Kevin Smith's guy from Toronto. He does all Kevin Smith's animation for Silent Bob. Um, he did it. And uh, yeah, I think that him? really helped. Huh? How did you get him? Um, you know, that's the other part of this that was, um, so, so, so these other components, when it was just besides James and I, we knew that we have some money that from ourselves, we're going to invest it in posts, in animation and posts. So online, that's what's so great about nowadays about being a film, an indie filmmaker is that you can just Google, you know, animation, you know, I found this artist on Twitter. Um, and I was just, I, I've been Googling animation. I, I went to a great, a great resource is just going to a local, um, Googling like your local animation college um, and watching people's reels, you know, yeah. so I watched a bunch, I watched a bunch. Then it just so happens I came across this animator on youth on um, Twitter. So I reached out to him. I was like, Hey, this is some of our footage. This is what we're doing. And he was like, Oh, this is awesome. So we got him like really cheap, um, you know, within our budget and he did great work. And then for the other people, we found them on a service called Mandy mandy.com yep. and that's just the thing where people are it's a filmmaker centered website where you you type in a job and you know people bid on it and then you go through people's reels and you interview them and that's the other thing of this is i had to be a producer james and i where we were actually i'd always gone out for jobs but i had never done the other side of it where now i'm interviewing people and looking at reels and doing all that as a director you do but not as a producer, you're, you're actually talking rates and stuff like that. All the stuff that artists say talking mm -hmm. about money and, and so all that. But we ended up finding an Emmy winner. He, he won an Emmy, Jeff Fuller, for the Sonic Highway Foo Fighters that was on HBO. Um, and he did all our sound design. Huh. And then we, yeah, and then we found an, Austra uh, an Australian expat that lives out here, Seti uh, Jansen. He's from Brisbane. Um, he makes music, and so I wanted kind of a classic Jesus, the artist. He's from London. He kind of comes from this post-punk, you know, scene. So I wanted something um, of that realm, and so Seti just made this amazing all original compositions within like ten days. Yeah. Um, fit our budget, and it was just everything kind of fell into place. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I think, I think when you make something like that, going back to what you said about social issues, when you make something that has something to say, people want to sign up on board. I mean, who wouldn't want to, Hey, the rates we, we were paying were much below people's normal rate. But when people are working on something they believe in that has something to say, you can get people to do stuff. You know, you can, as long as you're, you know, you manage their time and you're not taking advantage when you're like making these crazy demands if you're clear with what you want to, what you want from them, um, they'll give it to you, and they'll be more than happy to give it to you to collaborate and to feel a part of it. You know, when you're doing something with a social issue, there's there's a more it's more important than just making the movie. You know, you're making a movie with with a message, and I think people gravitate towards that, especially artists. You know, um, that are putting their time and hard work into something. 
And do you think you'll make another documentary? For sure, for sure. I've been playing with some ideas. Um, but yeah, I think it just goes hand in hand with my journalism background. Um, and, you know, you can make them for much cheaper and much less time than scripted stuff because with scripted stuff, you're, you gotta find funding, a lot more funding. You gotta find actors. It's all the, you know, there's just so much that goes into that. With the documentary, if you have a str if you have strong a strong team, which I'm building, uh, you can do one, you know, fairly quick and you know, fairly uh, with a small budget. It's just all about finding that topic, you know, finding a topic that that people can relate to, you know, for a documentary. I don't think I'm ever gonna make something on. The chinchilla that you know in some small village, or you know, I'm like that type of doc. I'm more of a social issue type document documentarian. Um, so yeah, I've got a few ideas. It's just all a matter of it falling into place and picking the right one. Yeah. So what's next for you? What are you working on now? So I I just finished this other um, horror thriller um, that we shot in Big Bear in the mountains. Yes, I um, saw that just yeah. before this interview. Oh, cool! Yeah, yeah I mean, I watched. I love the Babadook, which is an Australian, you know, Jennifer Kent. Yeah. Um, and I kind of, you know, I it's a very personal story about kind of my childhood that we kind of took domestic violence and, and looked at it through like a genre lens. Um, and we got this fabulous actor, Jenny um, Pelliser. She's an executive producer on it. And we, one of my um, producers that did worked on the, the graffiti short. Vanessa Perez um, kind of put it all together and we shot it and we've got a wonderful DP, Nico Aguilar. Um, and the, the kid actor is great, you know, uh, Tate Birchmore. So yeah, we just, we shot this piece in the, in the cabin over three days and it looks great. And uh, it's just, we just finished that actually like a month ago. Yeah. So now that's going out to the film festivals. Um, but you know, it took a while. I think you know with these with these shorts, everyone's kind of doing other things, and it's you know it's a you're kind of you can work on it when you can. You know, it's not like having that full where everyone is getting paid a lot. You know, and yeah. you can have their time. So people, you know, it's a passion project. So people are working on it and when they can and whatnot. So we finally finished it, and I hopefully want to turn that into a feature. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I think that's the next thing I need to do is like to make something that's longer than, you know, 12, 20 minutes or whatnot. Yeah. No, I yeah. really enjoyed it from the story and just hanging on to everything, waiting to see what happens. It was shot beautifully. You know, the cinematography yeah. was just amazing and the acting was great. It was just, yeah, really good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, it was, it was, um, you know, it's much different from tag with a POV thing. It, was, it looks like a real movie and, yeah. um, it's an important story. I think, you know, again, when you're telling, um, you're talking about an issue that, you know, people don't necessarily want to talk about. So you're looking at it through a genre lens that most that people can enjoy. And I love doing things like that. And it's not over the top. Like it kind of lets you kind of think what it could be. And it kind of, it's open-ended, which I, I love to do things that are open-ended where you walk away with your own thoughts about it, you know? When I we were right, when I wrote the script and we were off, like the crew and was asking me like, well, what is it? Is it you know? I won't get into too much into it, but I was like, I don't know. What do you think it is? I think that's your answer is what you want it to be and what you take from it. And I love things like that, like um, you know, watching movies that you put yourself in and you kind of walk away. They don't give you all the answers. You're supposed to have your own answers that are a part of you when you finish watching it. Yeah. Awesome. So how can people find you online? So uh, you can find me on my website, uh, by Patrick Green, by Patrick Green .com. Um, And then I'm, I'm, I'm on Twitter, uh, by Patrick Green. Um, it's Instagram, by Patrick Green. And um, Facebook, by Patrick Green. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, well, I can't wait to see your future work. I really enjoyed watching what I have so far. Um, I think oh, you're really you. talented. You have a great message and, um, yeah, good luck with it all. <laughs> thank you. <Olga. laughs>